Now throughout history, Northern England has produced some of the country's greatest ever athletes from across the sporting spectrum, but few have been such masters of their chosen sport as a young boxer from Manchester, who was sadly never rewarded for his achievements and who few people even remember today. Denied title belts he had won fairly, the young man Cunin turned his attention instead to politics and soon became a figurehead of his community, attending international conferences and standing up and campaigning for better living and working conditions for the people he lived amongst and grew up with. This is the incredible true story of Len Johnson, the people's champion. Leonard Benker Johnson was born in 1902 in Clayton to the east of Manchester. His father was a seaman from Sierra Leone by the name of William Johnson, and his mother was Margaret Mayer from Manchester, but of Irish descent. Their marriage was strong, but life for the Johnsons was marred by racist insults directed particularly at Margaret, who was attacked in the street for being married to a black man. Before World War I, Dad William Johnson had left the Merchant Navy and worked as an amateur boxer at fairground boxing booths at one point taking the family to live in Leeds. During the outbreak of war, however, the Johnsons moved back to Manchester and William joined the British Army. If we are taught Black British history, um, it begins with Windrush and we'll go, Britain was a homogenous white country that had some Irish people like scattered around the coast yeah. Um, and then, and yeah, there was, and there was not, never a brown person seen before 1955. Yeah, yeah. And it's just balderdash. It's just <laughs> not true. This is Deej Malik Johnson, and he's at the forefront of a campaign to get a statue of Len put up in Manchester. He was a sportsman as well as an activist. Like, how much more man can you be? Teenage Len had already shown a talent for boxing, but worked briefly at Crossley Engineering Works before he was encouraged to take it up more seriously. According to legend, Len had been involved in a scuffle outside the engineering works with another worker, and his father had to intervene to break the two apart. William then sent Len to the Alhambra Amateur Boxing Club in Openshaw to see where his talent could take him. Len honed his skill with a number of local boxing trainers, supported by his mother, who made him a pair of boxing shorts and provided him with a clothesline so he could skip at home. Johnson had his first professional fight aged just 17, and for the next few years his busy fighting schedule was a mixed bag, with some stunning victories, but also some disappointing losses, many by points decisions. However, Johnson was quickly developing a reputation for his unique fighting style. At six foot one, Johnson had a long reach, a powerful left hand jab, and fast feet that danced around the mat in the days when most boxers still just went backwards and forwards. In 1925, he beat European middleweight champion Roland Todd at Bellevue, and then former world welterweight champion Ted Lewis, who was widely acclaimed as one of the best fighters in the world. In 1928, he also beat renowned European middleweight champion Leon Giacovacci. Interestingly, Giacovacci also faced similar discrimination in his own career, being a man of mixed heritage growing up in fascist Italy. It was his victory over Lewis that really sparked controversy though. Johnson denied official recognition from the British Boxing Board of Control because of a rule that stated all title contestants must have two white parents. This colour bar was supported by the then Home Secretary, Winston Churchill, who upheld decisions to bar black fighters from competing at venues such as the Royal Albert Hall and the National Sporting Club in London. The crux of like Len's story, although the first part of his story really is, is that he was um, a, a champion boxer, really, yeah. but he was never, he never, never allowed to hold the titles. Yeah. What, why didn't the authorities want black men holding titles? With this, you've really got to look at the context of when of when Len was boxing, mm -hmm. um, what the world looked like at the time. In America, there was another boxer called Jack Johnson around the same time, um, who was a heavyweight. 
and he whilst he was allowed to have titles he was like he was arrested in every city that he went to he was seen as he was made a pariah in Britain, we often think of things like that over with people over there in America, and we'll think that we're so much better and we're so much more civilized because slavery didn't exist on our shores. What we were, we were the imperial power. And the only way that this small island off the coast of Europe was to maintain the biggest empire that the world had ever seen was if it was we projected power and we made, made sure that the people who we were that we had power over could never aspire to be fully themselves, could never aspire to be bigger and better, could never see themselves as strong, could never see themselves as beautiful, could never see themselves as champions. And boxing is a great equaliser, right? There is equality very few places in the world, but in the, in the boxing ring you have equality and it's just one person up against another person. Yeah, and if you had the if you had a white champion, a white British champion, who was beat by a black guy, that show that sends a very strong message out to the people in the colonies um, of going, you can you can be stronger, you can overcome, you can overthrow, you can seize power yourself. You've also got a title which says in no uncertain terms, the best. Frustrated, Johnson went to Australia, where he defeated Harvey Collins for the British Empire title belt. On returning to Britain, however, he discovered that the title he had just won had been officially considered vacant, and that a fighter called Tommy Milligan had been recognised for it. By now, Johnson was famous, particularly in Manchester, defeating some of the biggest fighters of the era. Yet despite this, Johnson was never allowed to claim any of the titles and became increasingly frustrated. Eventually, he was forced to retire at the age of just 30 due to his failing eyesight. Johnson's boxing career had been glorious without the glory and had taken him all over the world, fighting in front of record crowds. Like most fighters of his era, Johnson never gained much financially from his boxing and in retirement took up work as a truck driver and a foreman at a works in Oldham. But this wasn't the end of Len's story, far from it. After a lifetime fighting discrimination, Johnson now became a champion of others. Over the years, he'd formed a friendship with American civil rights activist Paul Robeson and the two wrote to each other frequently. Johnson later said of Robeson, he pointed out that my job was fighting, and if I could fight in the ring, then I ought to be able to fight outside of it. Johnson's campaign against the colour bar in British boxing was an entry into wider politics of the poverty and the discrimination faced by those around him. By the end of the Second World War, Johnson had joined the Communist Party, believing that only a fairer distribution of wealth would ever topple social injustices. In 1945, he was one of around 90 delegates to attend the 5th Pan-African Congress in Manchester, here at this old town hall. Though it was barely reported at the time, the Congress was groundbreaking, leading to the establishment of the Pan-African Federation and the recognition that black people the world over had to unite and challenge the institutional and societal racism of the day. By this time, Manchester's black population had grown significantly and Johnson recognised that many of the new arrivals would be facing racism in their everyday life that he had already a lot of experience with. With two white activists, Sid Booth and Wilf Charles, veterans of the fight against fascism in the Spanish Civil War, Johnson set up the new International Club on Grafton Street as a home for left-wing and anti-racist conversations and activism. It was one of the first places in Manchester to hold black and Afro-Caribbean club nights and was instrumental in campaigns against segregation and labour struggles. The new international club, on one level, it was the first um, black-led organisation, um, like social organisation that Manchester had had. 
but it was also like the lightning rod for everything that was happening. So if you had an issue, it was a safe place to organise, to go and meet people. And to like, and it wasn't just black people who went there. It was like the trade unionists who were, were, were there because Len was like active on the like on, on, on the left on the left in politics. That was the place where people went. And so you'd have a combination of like chats about like e racial justice and chats about socialism and chats about um, economic justice and talking to chats about um, equality in the workplace and having these like civil rights, the, these civil rights conversations. And then you'd go directly from the international club with a group of people who you know to, to, go, and, to, to go and fight on the, the, these issues. In 1949, Paul Robeson came to Manchester to perform in front of tens of thousands of Mancunians, organised by the New International. When Robeson had his passport revoked by the McCarthyist US government, Len, Wilf and Sid were the lead figures of the Let Robeson Sing campaign. When finally allowed to travel again, Robeson made sure to thank the club for its support, saying he would never forget that it was the people of Manchester and of other industrial areas of Britain who gave me the understanding of the oneness of people. Johnson's last big win came in 1953, when he and Wilf Charles set their sights on segregation in Manchester's pubs. Going one day into the old Abbey Tap House in Hume, Len asked for a drink at the bar. And as expected, he was refused because the pub did not serve black people. With this ammunition, Johnson wrote a newspaper column decrying segregation and began campaigning at the town hall for support among city councillors. Despite himself running as a Communist Party candidate for the city council and failing to get elected, Johnson was still widely recognised as a leader of Manchester's black community, and so his opinion carried a lot of weight. Within just three days, Johnson and his friends had organised a mass demonstration at the pub and facing such numbers, the landlord relented. I don't know if you've ever tried to turn down like 300 people from Moss Side, but it's quite hard. <laughs> um, and so like they broke the colour bar there, which then led to the colour bar being broken across Manchester, um, which went across Lancashire, and then throughout the north of England. And the ripple effects had to, had to the um, to anti-racist legislation going in, being passed in Parliament. In later years, Len Johnson worked for a haulage firm in Oldham, living here on Waterloo Street. He died in 1974, his passing largely anonymous in Britain. His gravestone in Southern Cemetery is modest and humble, but his legacy, anything but. Len's activism is, is you know, as we associate Len's story with, uh, it's a black story, isn't it? You know, and that is the, that's the pigeonhole we kind of put it in. But how did Len's activism and the activi activism of the other people at the New International Club um, and other socialists from that day, but how did that benefit the white working class as well? Because he was immensely popular after he, after he finished boxing Len. He was still popular with the white working oh, class, wasn't he? But like I said before, he was a Mancunian and he was a man of the people. There's a saying within like the black organizing community where your skin folk is not necessarily your kin folk. And like when you when we need to remember that we that we we will benefit and that this is a cent central for in lens activism, the black working class benefit when the working class as a whole benefit. And having the knowledge and when you have the knowledge that if you the, a black working class person and a white working class person and an Asian working class person has a lot more in common than with, with each other than they do with somebody with their with their skin tone, but who is um, but who is an oppressor. So why a statue? Why is it important that we have um, black role models today? I mean, that's two questions. <laughs> <laughs> statues are how we recognize what are values which are worth aspiring to it is there to show us that this is somebody that we should look up to 
there is, like in Manchester, we have statues to Vimto because Vimto is important and is incredibly Mancunian, right? We don't have any statues to black people. And you know what? A statue in the centre of Manchester of someone from Clayton who grew up who grew up to be so, like a great figure in for like in sports for in great figure for what like in the trade union movement great figure in activism who was a war hero but didn't have to didn't have to go away to be a war hero he was a war hero back at home it shows a different kind of hero and it shows that this is someone who we could look up to and the values that he had um as an activist as a leader um as somebody who didn't who wasn't born with like a silver spoon when you have when you're in a society which doesn't have which doesn't have many reflections of you it's hard to aspire to be to be many things there are a lot of things on Len that you could go actually that's something I can grab hold of and shows that I'm worthy and that I'm worth something and the more we can have that like, I don't see, like, a statue of Len Johnson as being the end point, but I think it's a really good step along the way. Now, Len's story was in danger of being lost to history, but recently there's been a renewed interest in this fascinating man. There's even an online petition started by Deej to get a statue of Len put up in Manchester. So please, please, please add your name to that petition and let's get Len recognised. After all, of all the Mancunians who've gone out and changed the world a little bit, few have had to fight quite so hard as Len Johnson, who put so much effort in and has been acknowledged so little. So, anybody watching this, how can they support the campaign for a, a statue for Len? What can they do? Right, so there is a few ways that people can um, support the statue for Len. Um, the really simple one is like again we're just adding add, add your name onto the change.org petition the biggest thing though the biggest thing that i ask of people is that when you hear len johnson's story tell somebody else this was lost to history for too long share this video like and subscribe um comment <laughs> um but yeah like tell people right just talk to just to just to like chat in work, chat with to your kids, chat to your like nieces and nephews, like going, have you heard about this guy? And and like then also like find out other stories like because Len isn't the only great person in my in, in 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 history who's been lost. Um so yeah, find out about him and tell folk.